Um, so we should be recording now. Fantastic. Uh, well, I'm just going to turn it over to you, Mara and Eric. Take it away. And um, looking forward to hearing more. Good. I'll go ahead and kick things off. So once again, my name is Eric Hansen. I'm a Carleton grad from 2020. Um, I actually started with BMO back when I was still at Carleton. So I, I did the junior year internship, which we'll, we'll cover off here. Um, and Mara did, the, I'll let her introduce herself as well, but she, she did the same. Um, we kind of did the typical path uh, that, most, that most folks take, which we can outline um, later in this, in this presentation. Um, but yeah, nice to be here. And nice to see uh, the, uh, the Carleton closets in the background. It's very, brings back a lot of good memories, so. Yeah, hi everyone. My name is Mara, excited to be here. And um, even if it's just two or three of you guys, it'll be a good chance to make it more back and forth Q&A um, instead of us just talking at you guys. So if you ever have any questions on anything we're saying, just feel free to interrupt us because want to give you guys the most valuable um, hour here of whatever you want to hear about. But yeah, I graduated St. Olaf um, in 21 and um, my career at BMO started just like you guys are right now at an info session where some alums um, did like similar, probably the same presentation or a, a version of it. And then um, from there did the internship, just like Eric said, and then came back full time and have been working ever since. So I don't know, Eric, if you want to just give an overview and then I can jump in as well. But yeah, so this is kind of just a quick overview, kind of, you know, there's a lot of, you know, I guess, misperceptions as to exactly what investment banking is and try, people trying to figure out kind of within the finance world, you know, what what it is that we do. You know, it's a lot of Excel spreadsheets and a lot of PowerPoints, but there's a lot of different, you know, pieces to it. Um, so this is kind of like a small overview of, of different parts of finance that we kind of work around, but we specifically work in the middle market M&A group. So that's mergers and acquisitions. So our, our job overall is we advise businesses. Um, sometimes it's, you know, family founder owned, oftentimes with our group, it's family founder owned businesses um, that, you know, started, you know, out of their garage or something like that. You know, in over 20 years, they built it into a, you know, multi-million dollar business that they then, you know, are wanting to retire and sell. Um, so our job is to advise uh, you know, these family founder owned businesses and other, you know, whether they be private equity or other ownership, uh, just on, uh, you know, essentially what their business is worth and helping them go through the mergers and acquisitions process, um, which is, you know, a very complicated thing that, you know, most people don't really know how to do, even if you've, you know, spent a lot of time, you know, working on your own business. Um, it's, a, it's a very specialized, you know, process that you have to go through. Um, and so we help them kind of beginning to end with all of that. Um, but there's a couple other things on here, you know, there's, you could be a commercial banker, you know, that's a lot of times, you know, giving, working with different companies, oftentimes in, you know, the middle market space, um, providing them loans or, you know, other, other financial instruments to help them, you know, operate their business and provide them with financing. Or, you know, we also work with, you know, a bunch of folks in sponsor finance, which is essentially, um, also giving loans and working with businesses, but from, you know, a private equity perspective, um, they provide loans for, you know, on the opposite side of a transaction, whether it be, you know, somebody going through, you know, trying to do a, you know, a takeover of one of these family founder owned businesses, a private equity sponsor um, is going to seek, you know, debt through, through one avenue or another. Um, so that's typically what we work with sponsor finance on. Um, but we sit in a specialty group being middle market M&A. Mara, you can, if there's anything else you want to add otherwise. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's all great to know. Really to put it simply, just like when you want to sell your house, you need a real estate agent. When you want to sell a company, you need um, an investment banker. So I think that's how I learned it. Um, and that's kind of stuck with me. We get a lot of um, candidates that interview with us that think we're picking stocks or, um, you know, doing things in the public markets. And so I think this slide is important just because the candidates that understand um, that, you know, we're not doing that stuff uh, actually look like they know what they're applying for, um, which I get it too when I was, you know, a sophomore, I don't think I knew. <laughs> but yeah, I think we can jump to this next slide. So just as Eric explained, we fit in the middle market M&A group and we touch, um, pretty much everything under the, the BMO financial group. 
umbrella. Um, so it's it's a really nice spot. Um, we're positioned under the commercial bank, um, but we're regulated with the capital markets team. So all those public markets things I was just talking about. Um, so we get all of the resources and training um, that all the global markets employees get in New York, um, London, wherever you name it. Um, but we have this access to the commercial banking team that has relationships with tons of clients that fit exactly what we're looking for. Um, so it's it's really nice. We get to work with a lot of founders and um, it's it's almost more of a consulting role because as Eric was saying, these people that, you know, they haven't, a lot of them haven't sold a business before. So it's, you get to walk hand in hand through the process a little bit more than if you just work with private equity firms that buy and sell companies for a living. But um, it also is nice because just in the way that we get the training from capital markets, we also get access to all of their different resources. So we have a graphics team where we can send a slide or a PowerPoint to and, and have them help us make it more creative and um, you know a bit of eye candy or something like that. Um, we also have a team that can help us with data pulling and, and doing research. Um, so we feel kind of like a boutique firm because we're a small group that's positioned within the commercial bank um, and that's how we started. But we have access to all these other resources which um, save a ton of time when you're an analyst and associate trying to, to do something um, maybe a bit later at night than you would have wished. Did you have anything else, Eric, you wanted to touch here? No, I think I'm good. I guess actually one thing now that I'm looking at it, um, the nice thing too is that um, our group is generalist. So we work on almost all industries, um, but we have industry coverage in our capital markets team. So we're able to bring in um, a chemicals team or a food consumer and retail team if we're going to do a pitch or um, even if we're going to do a deal and we just want to have someone that has better relationships um, in that specific subset of the industry. Um, and that's awesome because you get to meet more analysts and associates that are in different offices, but also they um, have a lot of slides that they put together regularly or different, you know, um, ways that they think about the industry that I think really strengthens what we do. So I can take this one. This is a kind of an overview of our of our group just in general. Um, so as you can see, we've got 50 plus. It, it kind of it's between 45 and 50 of us currently um, in our in our group, which um, is, is substantially larger than it was when I joined even, you know, two years ago in 2020, I guess almost three now. Um, when I joined, it was about 25 folks in our group. Um, and now we've about doubled in size. Um, and that's that's you know, a good thing when you're when you're talking about an investment banking group definitely means that you're uh, you're you're doing a lot of deals and you're, and you're growing and you know gaining market share with with your uh, with your peers. Um, and this is you know we can talk about that. There's ten folks in our group as well who are very specifically focused on private equity sponsor coverage. Um, so that's that's a piece of what we do. Um, is essentially having relationships with, uh, you know, all of the middle market private equity sponsors. So if you guys don't really know a whole lot about kind of the finance space, you know, private equity is typically, you know, they raise, you know, large funds, whether between, you know, 100 million and, you know, a billion dollars a lot of times in our case. Um, and they essentially deploy that capital buying, you know, businesses kind of in the range that we play, which is kind of, you know, 50 to 500 ish million um, total, total value for, for a business. Um, and so we've got, you know, 10 professionals on our team, which actually I'm, I'm one of those included because I sit down in the Dallas office. Um, and so we actually do our own uh, Texas sponsor coverage down here, the four folks down here. Um, and then we have four people who sit up in Minneapolis as well, who essentially cover the rest of the nation. Um, and so, you know, we have very specific relationships with these firms. We talk to them on a regular basis, usually at least quarterly. Um, and essentially, you know, hear what they're looking at in terms of businesses, uh, you know, if they're looking at, say, distribution businesses or food businesses or any of that, you know, we know generally like what they're looking for. Um, and so then whenever we pitch a business or we're sending a deal out to, you know, a number of buyers, you know, people typically go through us and ask us, you know, like, who should we include on this buyer list? And we send, you know, all of our thoughts. And, and that's, you know, a big piece of how, you know, you can help get a deal done in our space and having those relationships is definitely huge and being able to find the right buyers um, for a business. Uh, 
So that's your kind of just some key points on, on our on our group as a whole. You know, we've got, you know, a lot of very senior folks who have done a lot of a lot of deals. They're they're a very good resource for all of us. They have seen, you know, oftentimes like hundreds of deals get done or have been part of hundreds of deals. They've seen them go extremely well. They've also seen them fall apart and explode, you know, and just like be, you know, total, total messes, um, which is always a huge, a huge thing, you know, being able to learn how to you know, manage a process that's maybe even not going so well. Um, but our group, at least you can see, we do about 35 deals a year. So, you know, usually they do get done, you know, sometimes some take longer than others, but most of them do get done. Um, and then we can go over our four, our four uh, core industry verticals. Um, so this is how we break down kind of our business. Um, we've got senior folks who do, uh, you know, they typically, once you're above, uh, you know, my level being an associate, once you're a VP and above, you start to specialize in one of these four key, you know, of our four industries, um, being industrials, food, consumer, retail, healthcare services, and, and tech and business services, and CBS. Um, so we've got senior, senior people who, you know, spend their entire day essentially like calling and, you know, researching and, and knowing everything there is about, you know, each one of these, these industry subsectors. Um, and that being said, you know, even within like industrials, we have, you know, five or six different, you know, managing directors who cover, you know, different subsectors within industrials. So like some of them that cover, say, building products or, you know, distribution or manufacturing and, you know, everything kind of here and there in between. Um, so, you know, we're very strong in industrials and food consumer retail are probably our two major. And you can kind of see by pie chart here, industrials, you know, being typically both between our Minneapolis and Seattle office, and then our food consumer retail group is is very strongly concentrated in in our Seattle office. Um, but we're also kind of growing in that tech and business services. So if you're kind of interested in you know the internet, the internet space and SaaS businesses and all that, we uh, we're definitely going to that piece of our pie chart is definitely going to grow pretty significantly over the next year or two because um, we just brought on two new senior guys who are focusing explicitly on that tech and business services space. Um, so definitely a key focus for us there. Um, and then the, the last pie chart that you'll see the deals by type kind of goes back to what I was saying. Um, these are, you know, the ownership of, of the deals that we tend to do. So of say like the 35 deals that we completed, um, you know, 60% or so of the deals that we do tend to be family founder owned businesses. Um, so that's, you know, your mom and pop who built their business out of their garage and are looking to finally retire and, you know, float away on a yacht and, and have fun. So <laughs> that's that's a big a big piece of, of our business. Um, the private equity portion, the 20% is uh, advising, you know, private equity firms. Um, they both buy businesses as well as after, you know, five to seven years of holding a business, they, you know, eventually have to sell because that's part of, you know, how they make money is buying a business, you know, making it grow or, you know, making it more efficient and then selling it to somebody else at the end. Um, and so that's that's 20 about 20 percent or so of the business that we do. Um, and then these other two are kind of similar um, being corporate carve outs and kind of public company stuff. Um, the corporate carve out is essentially just like if if a public company has, say, a subsidiary business or a smaller business within it that isn't necessarily core to their operations, you know, they're they're looking to just sell, you know, some small, you know, if, if it's like a an industrial business that you know, does a whole bunch of manufacturing and stuff. And then they also just have a business that sells shoes for some reason, and they don't want to sell shoes anymore because that's not core to their strategy. Um, they'll typically want to carve that out and to somebody who, you know, wants to grow the business specifically focused on, on say shoes. Um, so that's, that's definitely a key portion of our business as well. Um, but just kind of based on our, uh, you know, our heritage of, you know, we used to be a, a boutique bank up in Minneapolis before we got acquired by, uh, BMO back in 2016, I believe. Um, so that was a big, a big portion of our business was the family founder own, and that still, you know, is is in our DNA today. Um, and then you can also see the the beautiful picture of the Wells Fargo Center in Minneapolis, where uh, our Minneapolis office is based. So we're on the the second to top floor of that building, and so you can you can get a, a lot of very good views up there. And uh, you know, late at night, you can also go out on kind of one of those little ledges out there, even though you're not really supposed to be out there. Um, you can open the window and go out there. So if, you, if you're an intern, we'll take you out there. <laughs> I'm jealous. That sounds like an amazing place to work. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. Um, and a another thing I would mention, you know, these statistics probably don't mean that much um, just out of context, but 
Um, our group has been mandated to double our size in the next couple of years. Um, so we'll probably have closer to 100 professionals in five years. And um, that's a really great thing to think about when you're applying for things because there's tons of uh, groups on Wall Street right now that are letting go of a lot of analysts and associates and cutting bonuses and stuff. Um, but just with our unique position being under the commercial bank, we have a huge pipeline of all of these um, family founder owned uh, clients that have to sell their business because they, they don't have um, a plan for once they you know want to retire or they don't have a, a child that wants to run it. So we have tons of deals that need to get done in the next couple of years. And um, there's, you know, we're really established in Canada, but um, for some of this, we're still really growing. So it's an awesome place to be as an analyst and an associate, because there will always be space for you to move up to the next level. We don't hire on contract, like most of the other banks in, in Minneapolis and New York, where they expect to let you go after two or three years. We hire everyone with the intention that um, if you have a good two years, then you'll be an associate just like Eric. So um, I just think that's really important because that's something that I never really thought about at St. Olaf when I was applying to things like it's, you know, what does the company look like right now, but also how are they going to look in five years? And is, is there still maybe going to be a space for me to, to fit in there? But did you have anything else, Eric, or should we move on? No, I mean, the only thing that I'd add is, you know, our group obviously is growing very quickly and that's just specifically the middle market M&A group, but also, you know, BMO overall as a brand is, is growing pretty, pretty substantially in the United States. So like, obviously she said, it's, you know, Bank of Montreal, it's, it's, you know, one of the top three banks in Canada, everyone in Canada knows the name. Um, but now, you know, BMO just recently acquired uh, Bank of the West, which is another large commercial bank in the Western United States. So we're actually now the eighth largest bank in North America. Um, and I think the fourth largest commercial bank in, in the US. So, you know, definitely as a name brand over the next, you know, five years, hopefully more people will know the name as well. So definitely a great, a great place to work um, in terms of that growth. Yeah. So, I mean, I think for this slide, I'll start off and talk a bit about what I do as an analyst. Um, and then maybe Eric can share about now um, being an associate, how things might look a little different. But when you first start out as a first year, um, you'll probably be paired on a, a deal team where you're working with a senior analyst or a younger associate or someone that has the capacity and patience to really sit down and do most everything with you. Um, so no worries, that was a fear of mine before starting. There's no cheat guide, every bank is different, um, but, so you spend a lot of time um, each day uh, looking at numbers and, and looking at um, things that your client sends you that will eventually become really important uh, when your buyers are doing due diligence and, and need to underwrite basically um, the transaction and, and making sure they understand everything before they, they buy it. Um, and another huge piece I would say is um, understanding the story and the strategy of your client. Um, analysts spend probably 70% of their day in PowerPoint, um, helping build materials that we send out to buyers. Um, so you'll start with a, a one page or two page anonymous teaser, which we send to buyers before they've executed a, an NDA. And that will have kind of everything you need to know about the business on a no names basis. And if buyers are interested, they can sign an NDA and we'll send the confidential information presentation, which can be anywhere from, you know, 50 to 100 pages. And analysts are responsible for um, most of what goes on there, at least the first draft. Um, so that's something that I think I um, didn't know as much when I was applying how much time you're going to spend creating things, um, being creative and um, moving things around so they look good. Um, but that's, it's a fun piece too. Um, I would say another thing, you'll spend a lot of time in meetings, um, which sounds boring, but given that our clients are middle market size, like you're talking to the CEOs and the founders every day. Um, it's, it's a little bit different than other banks that are selling huge companies that have a specific, uh, department specifically there to sell their company. So you get a ton of exposure to leaders in the industry and 
by the end of a deal, you'll probably have their cell phone numbers saved on your phone and have probably had some painfully laid calls with them. And a lot of them just act as um, mentors, which, which is really awesome to have that access right out of college. And then finally, administrative tasks are unfortunately um, a big part of it as well. But um, sometimes it's kind of nice to do that after you've spent a lot of time doing more um, sensitive tasks, I guess, that you can kind of just sit back and make sure you're organized and um, make sure your buyer logs have all the information that's up to date, make sure um, everything's organized when you're setting up presentations with the client and buyers, all that kind of stuff. Um, but I would say as an analyst, um, usually what happens is you work closely with your associate and they um, give you tasks and you usually take the first stab or you split it up and you do one thing and they do the other. Um, but then they will almost always review your work and then give you comments or, or make um, edits directly before any of the senior bankers see it. Um, and I think that's a really awesome way to do it because you're getting live feedback every day from people that have worked for several years in this job. Um, so that was huge for me just as coming from a liberal arts background and, and not having as much finance exposure. Mar and Eric, I think there was a question that came up. Kevin. Yeah, Kevin, I, I saw the hand go up. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm Kevin, junior at, at Carleton College studying economics. So I had a question for Maria about the typical daily assignments. So you said like 70% was just in PowerPoint. Could you like, is that also like reviewing the materials? And then could you go a little bit more on like, what do you mean by analysis? Sure. Yeah. So I, I guess probably 70% of your day um, is spent in PowerPoint when you're making materials. There will be times in, in the deal once you already have that done where you're spending more time, um, you know, in like virtual data rooms, which are basically just like expensive Google drives um, where you're managing all the client information and responding to buyer questions. Um, but yeah, when you're drafting materials, um, you'll spend most of your day in PowerPoint and, um, you'll probably spend like 20% of your day in Excel building like a financial model or a data book. Um, and then the rest of that is just doing admin tasks or um, other things that come up. Um, but then once you're in the market, it's much more like responding to emails and, and tracking buyers and all that stuff. So it's a little different at every point of the phase. Um, but for analysis, it depends on the business you get. But let's say you get a client that um, is a distribution business, the data book that we build will be a huge part of um, what we present to buyers. And it'll show things down at like the product or SKU level and, and look at volume, where they're selling to, um, what uh, the margin looks like, um, their customer profile, who their vendors are, everything like that. So um, a lot of we obviously have to understand all the trends ourselves if we're going to send it out to buyers. So that's, that's a big piece. Um, and then there's just a lot of other random things that they'll, they'll send us that we have to um, look at and understand. And, and it varies a lot by the business, but um, Eric, I don't know if you have anything to add there, but would just say like some of the businesses don't really have a lot of data. That's, that's great. So you'll do a lot less of that, but distribution would be a, a big one where you spend a lot of time. Yeah. It, yeah. It really just depends on the business. Cause you know, essentially analysis just means, you know, taking whatever data they collect. And as she said, you know, sometimes you're working with, you know, mom and pop businesses that never really set up, you know, and on like a good way to track their data over time. You know, obviously a buyer, you know, who's looking to, you know, spend millions and millions of dollars on a business typically wants to know just about everything about, you know, the business that they can, who they're selling to, what they're selling, you know, all of that. Um, so our job is essentially to do our best and essentially cut that data that we can get in essentially any way that we can. You know, that's that's kind of what the data book is that we would put together. It's just an Excel, an Excel uh, you know, presentation that has, you know, maybe 50, 50 tabs on it that's going through, you know, 50 different cuts of the data trying to, you know, show exactly what, you know, people are hopefully trying to look for. Yes, Lucas. Um, no, so I just wanted to ask, so being that, you know, I go to, so I go to Carleton and uh, at a liberal arts college, there aren't a lot of opportunities to formally learn accounting. So is this something, so is account, 
did this level of accounting something that I can learn on the job or is it something that I should be spending time on the side learning uh, formally? So that's a I good think... question. And I can, I, can ex I can answer that from my own Carlton experience as well because Mara went to a school called St. Olaf that actually has accounting classes, I think. Um, I, I took an accounting class between my freshman and sophomore year, just like in the summer. Um, I, ever, I grew up in Wisconsin, so I just did it from like a small state school, just did like a, you know, a, an online kind of, you know, course for managerial accounting. Um, so I did that and like, you know, it was like essentially like a 101 class in, in accounting. Um, so that definitely helped. Um, I mean, there's a lot of resources online too that kind of go over just like general accounting stuff um, as well. I would say a lot of it you can you know, learn on the job. I definitely, you know, when I showed up, I definitely was not an accountant. I definitely did not have as, as great of an idea as, uh, you know, as many people who are finance majors coming from like U of M or, or anything like that. But um, it, it's good definitely to have kind of that like groundwork laid, um, at least, you know, some, some amount of being able to understand financial statements and, you know, being able to kind of walk through, you know, on like an income statement, you know, top to bottom, like how everything kind of fits together. Um, that's typically questions that we'll ask in, you know, a, an internship interview is just kind of like how do the financial statements, you know, connect and flow together and all of that. So definitely a good, a good thing to know um, for trying to get to the job. Martin, yeah, I think, um, I think both schools have access to Harvard Business School online courses too. So if that was something that you had time to do, you could take, um, oh yeah, yep. Um, you could take a, a class there and that would be fine. Um, also what I did at St. Olaf, um, taking Pillars of Wall Street, I think was really helpful because um, our job is less about really getting in the weeds on um, the actual accounting and the practices, but it's more about um, like projecting um, performance of the business and, and understanding how to value a business. Um, so I think you know, there are tons of PDFs out there for prepping for um, investment banking interviews. So my advice and what I did is go through those and, and try to understand it and try to learn it by doing YouTube videos or something or, um, you know, have asking for 30 minutes with a Carlton alum uh, to sit down with you and, and explain it. Um, because I think, you um, the technicals are going to be the bigger piece. It's not probably going to come up if you've taken an accounting class. It's probably just going to come up in how you can demonstrate that you've done some prep for the interview. But yeah, you won't be behind. Really Eric you're replacing I... Wall Street. I'm, I'm glad that Wall Street prep is replacing Pillars of Wall Street. I've done, I've done a number of them. Like I've done like Wall Street Oasis stuff. I've done Pillars of Wall Street. Done Wall Street prep. Um, Pillars of Wall Street was not the best. So I definitely, yes. I'm, I'm happy you guys are. We use, when when you are an intern with BMO as well, they give you access to like Wall Street prep online courses and all of that. So you have a lot of those resources. So that's what we use as well. Um, yeah, that's another thing I should mention. So for the internship, you'll spend a week um, either remote or I think in the past, it's been in, in New York pre-COVID. So not sure if they would change that back for the next couple of years. Um, and then when you actually come on as a full-time analyst, you'll spend probably two months with some of that being in Toronto. Um, and then some of that just being either virtual or in your home office. And um, they'll go over all of that. So I think when I was nervous about that, the St. Olaf alums that worked there said, we pretty much learned the accounting major in three days, or at least like what you need to know from the accounting major to be an investment banker. So not to sound overconfident, but don't worry about coming from a liberal arts background because you'll learn it all on the job. And um, all my coworkers that are accounting majors have probably forgotten a lot of the details anyway, um, just as I've forgotten a lot of econ from my time at St. Olaf. So definitely not something to stress about. I will back that up. I was actually in an accounting major in undergrad and I forgot it. <laughs> so you're on, you're on point about that. <laughs> yeah. Eric, did you want to add anything here? Um, I could just quickly kind of go over, like, you know, obviously I, I did my two years as an analyst. It's, you know, a lot of late nights. You know, there's still a lot of late nights as an associate, but you, you don't have to do quite quite as much, I would say. So my my role is essentially, you know, Mar, Mara was saying that, you know, usually you're you get paired with an associate who, you know, essentially mentors you, helps you walk through the process, especially the first, you know, couple of pitches and deals that you're doing when you have really no idea what's going on. Um, that's me and Mara are great friends now because she was my, my little analyst when I was 
when I was, uh, you know, a young associate in that in that role. Um, so, you know, I, I spend a lot of my day, you know, coaching, you know, analysts as well on on how to do the job, um, you know, giving them feedback on, you know, at least higher level feedback on, you know, what we're looking for in terms of putting together, you know, a pitch or, you know, a like the confidential information for presentation, and all that, making sure that, uh, you know, all the pieces are kind of moving in the right way. You know, coordinating also between you know our v our VPs and managing directors above us, um, who kind of are, have less of their hands, I would say, in the actual you know creation of the materials um, and doing a lot of the analysis. Um, they typically spend most of their time on the relationship side and kind of driving the process from that that perspective. Um, so as an associate, kind of my role is you know to mentor and essentially make sure that everything that needs to get done in the process is getting done. And reminding everyone to do everything that they need to do um but i also do spend you know pretty much a lot of my time doing a lot of the same stuff that uh, mara does as as an analyst um you know i usually am in powerpoint and excel and i make sure to review you know everything that kind of gets done because at the end of the day you know the associate is you know kind of the choke point between the lower level and the upper level so everything that gets passed along kind of falls on my shoulders and you have to also be there to, uh, you know, take the fall. If something, something isn't right, it's, it's my fault and it's not her fault. So um, that's, that's typically what we do, uh, you know, as associates and, um, you know, but it's definitely a, a little bit better than being an analyst. You'll, you'll do it for a couple of years and you'll, you'll, uh, you know, it eventually, eventually it gets better. <laughs> I'm a I'm Eric and I'm Eric's analyst on a current deal right now, so <laughs> would echo all of that. But all right, so I think you know we covered a lot of this, but um, I think a really cool thing about working in investment banking is you're surrounded by all of these driven people. Um, everyone had to put in the work to to get through the interviews and um, get through the internship and decide not to quit. So everyone that you work with, you can learn something from whether they're your intern or um, your managing director. And I think that's really awesome. Um, and then just as mentioned before, you'll get tons of exposure to CEOs and CFOs that um, have been with their business for years. And it's, it's a really interesting perspective. Eric and I worked on a bus deal, um, a school bus deal, last year and the founder of that you know he just kind of became our grandpa just with the, the stories that he would tell us and we could not get off a weekly update call um in under an hour if he was on it so he was super knowledgeable and 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 really sweet and um the other associate that worked on that um i think the ceo called him up personally and said if you need anything you let me know yeah there's the school bus deal yeah yeah, here's, um, here's our here's our deal toy. When you finish when you finish a deal, you you get like a little trophy for for finishing it. So we have our little school bus that that you get to order. Yeah. So you get fun toys too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then obviously these are a bit more surface level, but you'll be compensated really well. You are asking um, they're asking you to give up a lot of your time um, as an analyst, and you will be expected to work late nights. So you'll be compensated for that and. Since I was a um, since I was an intern, I think first year analyst salary has gone up like thirty percent. So the the industry has really responded to um, to the analyst uh, pleas for earning even more, just given how many hours we work. And so I think it's a it's a really fantastic time to to start off. Um, and then if you ever decide that you don't want to do investment banking anymore, this job really sets you up well to do really anything, um, but especially private equity, venture capital, corporate development, um, or just go work at a corporate company in one of their finance departments. Um, if you look at a lot of job descriptions, a lot of them will say two years of investment banking, consulting, or, or relevant experience. So it's kind of a cool um, training program in a way to think of it. Um, for doing really anything else, just because you work with so many different businesses, you see the operations, the financials, the strategy, the marketing, everything. Um, so I think I think that's awesome. And and once you start, the recruiters will be flooding your inbox. So if you get even the slightest bit of itch to do something else, um, you won't have to look very far. But hopefully you stick it out. <laughs> 
And then, um, Eric, I don't know if you want to start with this one, then I can just jump in. Yeah, so I can I can start with this one. So, you had, I think we'll talk a little bit more about kind of uh, the BMO internship as well. But that's that's kind of you know what you would typically do between your junior and senior summer. Um, we'll we'll talk a bit more about that recruiting timeline. It'll it's it's a bit extreme, I would say, in, in terms of you know other other careers. Um, usually, you recruit kind of in your sophomore year for you know, an a internship between your, your junior and senior year. So it's almost a full year ahead of time. So that's going to be opening, you know, in the next month or so for, you know, next summer, essentially. Um, so you do that. That's an eight to 10 week internship. Usually, I think the first week, Mara, is, is training, um, which you'll do kind of as a group um, with all the interns across all of the locations, um, both in Canada and the U.S. Um, so Sometimes it's over Zoom. A lot of times they do bring you in for a couple of days to New York or another location where you actually get to meet them and you know have some fun and like meet meet new people. Um, so you do that for about a week, and that's like a crash course in essentially you know how to be a professional, how to do the job, um, you know general kind of overviews on on PowerPoint tips and tricks, Excel tips and tricks, as well as just like uh, you know a few days of going into actually like financial modeling which is you could do, you know, a number of courses through Wall Street Prep and all of that. Um, a lot of times they bring in, you know, professionals who do it, you know, who train people from all over the world. Um, and they, they train you for two or three days on, you know, essentially how to do the job. And then uh, if you, you know, do well in that internship, um, we've got a pretty good track record of bringing in folks who, who then get a return offer um, as a, as a full-time analyst, um, which then you would start uh, after your you know, after you graduate in the summer, um, usually you start in July, early July, um, and then you spend about the first month or so doing, uh, you know, training, and then you hit the desk in August, and essentially it's kind of off to the races from there, and it's it's going to be like drinking from a fire hose and, uh, you know, doing pitches and deals and being in, you know, calls with CEOs and CFOs and trying to, you know, essentially figure out, you know, how to do the job, um, each and every day. Uh, and sometimes there are late nights. A lot of times those are, you know, a lot of times it's because you just don't exactly know what you don't know. And so you spend a lot of time trying to figure it out. And that's, that's just part of the job. It's kind of the only way you can, you can do it. Um, but I always like to tell my analysts whenever they're, you know, having a hard time that, you know, there really is kind of a, a threshold where it's after, you know, six to 12 months that, you know, something just kind of flips and then you essentially do everything a little bit faster. You've already seen how to do everything. You kind of know where everything is. And then suddenly the job gets like a whole lot easier. Um, then you you kind of work through that. Um, it says two to three years. Uh, you know, for our group, it's it's almost always two years. Um, you kind of go in, you go through the two-year training program as an analyst, um, and at the end of those two years, you get either you know decide if you want to move on. You can move on, but if if you want to stay, um, you become an associate. So that's what I did. I went through the two years, um, got the promotion, and then you know you just kind of keep you keep going on. Um, and you essentially become a mentor to, to the folks. Um, thanks, Leo. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, I, I'm currently an associate, and then you spend about, you know, kind of at that level, it kind of depends. Um, moving up to the next, the next level, it says two to four years. It kind of depends on, um, you know, just where you are in the training cycle, how, how well you work with clients, because um, that next step up to a vice president is, kind of moving a little bit out of, you know, the actual workflow of the materials and all of that, it moves more into, you know, client management, you know, you have to do some, you know, going out there and actually talking to business owners and trying to convince them that you're the right person to help sell their business. You have to start to specialize in an industry, you have to start getting smart on, you know, a specific industry that you're interested in. Um, and you essentially are, you know, the, the general kind of giving commands to all of the, you know, associates, analysts, and interns below you to get, you know, a lot of the actual, you know, work that gets done on the deal done. Um, and so, you know, just like I would be the associate where I, you know, have to check everything that the analyst does, the VP checks everything that we do, and they are ultimately responsible for, you know, the, the deal at the end of the day. Um, then you kind of move into that director and managing director role. Um, they're both a little bit, I would usually consider a director role. Um, you know, that's, that's kind of where you become a real senior banker. You're out there, you know, pitching, pitching clients. You are the, the guy who's out there trying to win business. That's when it starts to flip to more of a sales role rather than um, being more of, you know, in the deal every, each and every day and knowing all of the details. Um, 
depends on who you are. A lot of them do stay very close to the deal and know, you know, each and everything about it and are very, very close to it. Some are a little bit more removed and are more of kind of the sales guy. Um, so, you know, they're the ones going out there, finding businesses, going out there, you know, pitching and working with a bunch of other managing directors from all over the bank to try to find business and, and generate revenue for BMO as a whole and our group. Um, so that's, that's kind of when, you know, you're, you're the guy who gets to go to bed at, you know, six o'clock and spend time with your family and all of that. Um, but our, our group is very good. You know, I wouldn't think about these directors and managing directors at some other banks. You typically hear horror stories of people who are just angry, mean old men who, who do deals. But I would say our group is very, very, you know, family friendly. Our group is very uh, friendly with um, uh, essentially work-life balance. So, you know, a lot of them care a lot about you and they spend a lot of time calling you and making sure that you're, you're doing well. They try to mentor you as well as they can. Um, they're really good references for, for pretty much anything in the business and they, they care a lot about us. So, or I don't know if there's anything you would want to add here. Yeah, um, I don't know if it's necessarily relevant to this slide, but, um, you know, I think in this, these 45 minutes, we've said a lot of, you know, cool things, but also a lot of scary things. And investment banking is, it's going to be a lot of hours, but I think BMO is truly a phenomenal place to work. Um, all my coworkers are some of my best friends and um, our group head uh, really does a lot to sponsor us. He has given us money to go to Vegas and, and just have fun and, and not work. And um, he checks in on us every other week um, with a phone call, even if it's, you know, your first six months of working, you're going to talk to the group head regularly and he's going to know your name. Um, so Eric's absolutely right. There's a ton of horror stories, but all the managing directors in our group, I would feel more than comfortable to sit down and have dinner with them. And um, I think um, investment banking can actually be a really awesome place to, to start your career because everyone is young as an analyst. Um, I have a lot of friends that go into other fields and um, they're the only new grad and um, they report to someone that's, you know, been out of school for a long time and is a little out of touch with um, what you might be feeling as a, a, a 23 year old. So I think it's, it's really cool. And if I were to bring my computer right now and show you downtown at the office, there'd be a bunch of people hanging out there and, and working together in a silly environment. So um, even though, you know, we keep saying you don't get to go to bed until your X level of whatever, um, you really, after the first three to six months, once you start to feel pretty confident, um, you can start speaking up a bit more and, and you'll know what to expect in a process and you can create work-life balance. There's going to be times that that things are more busy, but um, especially if you're a good team player and, and um, you establish a relationship with your coworkers, they're definitely going to understand if you need to um, take a day off for a personal reason or go on a vacation. In fact, that's encouraged Eric's going on one tomorrow. <laughs> um, but um, just wanted to give that little promo because I think, you know, a lot of this can be really daunting, especially coming from a liberal arts background. But, you know, there's tons of opportunities to learn. And it's definitely not something that we expect people to come on their first day and um, be a born banker. So yeah, and that, that reminds me as well, we also do have in terms of mentorship opportunities, um, as soon as you essentially hit the desk as an analyst, you get assigned, um, you get assigned mentors specifically that, you know, our group just assigns you to, you know, managing directors, directors, I think maybe some VPs as well, um, that you, they essentially give you, you know, funding to, you know, at least once a, a quarter, I think it technically is, or maybe it's once a month. Um, you can go out and get a coffee. You can go out and get lunch. Um, they just give you, you know, a fund of money to go and, you know, ask questions, you know, off the record, even it's not really even, you know, it's, it's career related. So if you're, you know, thinking, you know, maybe I don't want to be a banker forever. Maybe I want to explore other things. You can go out and ask your mentor, you know, what is it like to do other things? Cause a lot of people have done different things other than banking in their, in their careers. And so they will essentially have a confidential conversation with you about kind of anything and everything. You can talk to them about if you're stressed out at work, you can talk to them about, you know, how can I be a better banker? How can I do, you know, what I want in my career? Um, so that's also a big part about our, about our group. Not only does say the group head call you every two weeks, you, you also have these other specific mentors who, you know, spend a lot of time and care to, to help you get to where you want to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So before we talk about current opportunities, um, 
I think one thing we didn't necessarily cover is where all of our offices are. Um, so I work in the Minneapolis office here, obviously, which you saw on a prior slide. And um, Eric works down in Dallas, but we also have um, an office that's a little smaller than the Minneapolis office outside in Seattle, and that's where our group head sits. Um, and then we have a couple people in Chicago, and then we have a couple of remote places um, like Boston and um, a couple other stragglers. But um, there's tons of flexibility there. If you want to be an intern, you can be an intern in um, for sure Minneapolis and Seattle and, and probably Dallas eventually. Um, Chicago is a little small right now to, to bring someone on um, there because it's mostly capital markets focused. But um, that's a cool little bit. And there's a ton of flexibility to work in one office for a couple of years and then pending space. You can, you know, if I wanted to move down to Dallas right now, they would definitely have me. Um, so I think that's a, a fun thing too. Um, some other banks are a little less flexible with that. Um, just because of how how their numbers shake out. So that's a cool little bit. But currently, um, we're looking for 2024 summer analysts. So if you are a sophomore right now, I think that'd be right. Yeah. Um, if you are a sophomore that will graduate in 2024 in December or in um, the spring of 2025, um, we are looking for you. Um, it would start next June and be about 10 weeks. Um, yeah, did you have a question? Thanks, Mara. I was just going to um, ask, as you talk about these, if you have any tips for preparing for interviews for these roles, that would be great. Um, I know yeah. we really wanted to hit on to today, making sure that we get an understanding of what it's like to interview for investment banking. and, and For sure. Like yeah. A little different. That'd be awesome. Thanks. Yeah. So um, I think there is one interview before you know, you ever talk to someone like me or Eric, um, and I think that's just with HR. So that's just a screener. They probably ask you some like really general questions um, that we don't really have a lot of insight into, but it's not supposed to be hard. It's just basically supposed to make sure that you're a person, um, you know, and you've been um, looking at this opportunity um, and have a, a clear reason why you want it. Um, but um, another thing is if you guys talk to us, we can obviously make sure that your resume gets pulled through because um, we, we know who you are. We've, you know, we've met you guys. So you guys will have to make sure to, to let us know and maybe follow up with us if you're interested because um, people can get lost in, in the application. But um, then after that, um, you'll have a couple interviews. Sometimes you'll just have a, a big super day or a couple of different rounds spread out depending on people's schedules. Um, and one of those for sure will be dedicated as a technical interview. Um, and it's been done a little differently each time, but I think we're leaning more toward that being a case study. So what they'll do is they'll probably give you some sort of scenario. Like let's say we have a company that we're gonna go pitch for. Um, it's a pet company that makes pet food and they're, this size um, in this geography. And then we start like asking some questions about how would you go and value it? Um, what are the different valuation methods? What metrics would you look at on their financial statements? Um, things like that. Um, but they're basically just like embedding all the technical questions that you'll see on like the PDFs that you Google into a scenario. Um, so we don't get candidates that just memorize every question and answer and try to like put it on a paper and recite it back to us. Um, and then a lot of your other interviews, especially if you talk to VP and up, will be mostly just cultural and, and getting to know you. You might get some questions about um, giving a time where you've had a problem that you have to solve or a question like that, a behavioral. Um, but a lot of times they just want to know what you know about our group and what about that excites you. Because um, with investment banking, our group will get hundreds of applications just from places like LinkedIn. And like I mentioned earlier, a lot of them think that we're trading stocks and, um, and doing stuff like that, which is just not what our group does. So you guys are at a huge advantage for sitting through this session and, and listening to us talk for a little bit, because hopefully now, if, if you're interested, there's at least, you know, one or two things that you could pinpoint as as to why. So um, that's kind of my advice. I think for coming from a 
liberal arts background to get the technicals. Um, what I did was I practiced them with my parents because they did not have a financial background. Um, and if you can explain something like a discounted cash flow valuation to your mom who's in a completely unrelated field, then you'll probably be pretty comfortable um, doing so in a, an interview where they'll be able to give you a little bit of um, context and, and understand the things that you're saying. So my advice would be to have um, a student or a friend of yours on campus that has nothing about this or like knows nothing um, and just try to explain some of those concepts until it finally makes sense. Because when you try to explain something like that, you'll understand really quickly like what you don't actually know and what you've just memorized and um, just stored up there. Um, so that would be a big thing because I think that really stands out um, when we see people trying to use some sort of cheat sheet or using the exact words that are found on some guide on the internet. Um, but I think our group technicals are obviously important. Um, but I would say a, a big thing that's even more important is just making sure that you have um, talked to an analyst or an associate or attended a session like this, um, just so we can sort out people that have a genuine interest from those that are just stamping their resume off and, and mailing it to a hundred different banks. Um, so that's, that's kind of my advice there. Um, don't know if you guys have any specific questions where Eric and I do all the interviews. So we're obviously happy to, to be super transparent. All right. Well, that's a great overview. Um, Thanks. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Um, if you guys aren't sophomores, we definitely still have, um, you know, we're constantly looking for analysts that um, come on after graduation. And I think we're, um, we've already done the recruiting for that for those that would start this summer in July, but there's often times that um, we just need to add someone based on deal flow and, and capacity. So just constantly look out for places like LinkedIn or um, handshake or anything like that when it says analyst. Um, we'd obviously love to have you guys, even if, you know, it's in a couple of years once you've graduated. So I think, um, I think that's it. But obviously, if you guys have any questions on anything we said, we're happy to answer them. Otherwise, um, you have our emails and, and you're more than welcome to, to give them out to students, even if they couldn't make it today as well. Yeah, Kevin. I just have one brief question i was thinking so how did you guys being from liberal arts like really sell yourself to these other to these companies such as bemo because i mean given that we're economics ma economic majors we don't really have that background on and like like you said finance or accounting so what was your selling point in these interviews that really drew yeah. these companies to you that's a good question. I, um, I can go first go and then Eric, you can, yeah, you can it. say it as well. But for me, um, I think a big selling point was how many conversations I had had with two associates at BMO back, back in the day. Um, just because I think the main thing when we get um, liberal arts students applying is they don't always know what they're applying for. So being able to really demonstrate that you know um, exactly what mergers and acquisitions um, entails and, and why you're drawn to that. Maybe it's you like a fast paced work environment and you have an example of something that, you know, felt really sleepy and you, you know, couldn't sit at your desk without falling asleep. I don't know. Um, but having specific examples of why you're drawn to our group, you can talk about the culture, um, the opportunities for advancement, anything like that. Um, that's huge. Um, and then I think for not having the finance background, for me, I talked about like exhausting all the things that St. Olaf had to offer with the pillars of Wall Street, um, other things that I did on my own, the research that I did, um, talking to people at other banks as well. Um, I ended up getting a, um, an internship my sophomore year as well, which was in commercial banking. So it was a little different, but just talking about that. Um, and even if you don't have any internship experience, if you have a research um, position or if you had a club on campus where you've done something where you use critical thinking and, and um, maybe think about strategy or something like that. Um, I think people get a little hung up on 
oh, I haven't had um, a class on, you know, accounting or something like that. But um, there's a lot of other pieces that go into making an investment banker. So I think just making sure that you make those things obvious. Um, and our group, I think, is really receptive to, to liberal arts backgrounds. Um, I think the main thing that matters is just that you've talked to people in our group and, and really understand what you're applying for. Yeah, I'd, I'd second a lot of what Mara says. And honestly, you know, I, I, I often have the perspective that, you know, if you are a liberal arts student and you can show, you know, that you know what the job is, you've talked to a number of people, you really understand kind of what it entails um, and you, you hustle for, for what you do have because at Carleton, you know, we have, don't have, you know, maybe, you know, all the same kind of finance resources, but, you know, if you show that you have, you know, taken the initiative outside of your classes to, you know, learn accounting or start to learn how to model or, you know, talk to like as many investment bankers, like definitely utilize your, your Carleton alumni network. Like it's, it's definitely huge. And a lot of them, you know, I, I've talked to, you know, a very large percentage of, of the folks that, that ended up going into finance and banking, um, just using the, the Carleton alumni portal, um, you know, using them for, for find, trying to find internships as well. Um, just just kind of doing anything and everything to be able to, you know, show that even though you don't have quite the same resources or the same classes as everybody, that, you know, you've essentially like burned every single, you know, you, you've gone down every single path trying to, you know, do as much as you can to try to get up to that level. And I think that that's like, you know, even potentially like more receptive, we'd, we'd be more receptive to that than say, you know, just another finance guy coming out of, you know, University of Minnesota who has the same resume as everybody else. Um, yeah. Yeah, Lucas. Oh, um, well, my question is somewhat related, but uh, so more generally, so being that investment banking isn't one of the more popular majors uh, for grads from at Carleton, I don't know about St. Olaf, but um, so to what extent did you have to find opportunities yourself versus getting opportunities through recruiters on campus? Um, for um, other I, banks or? or no, just, just in general, as you were going through the whole, uh, I guess, career development process over during college. I definitely, for, like, for one, I, I got a lot of my internships just sending emails to people asking for, you know, 30 minutes to chat about, you know, what they do. And just like knowing that if you want to be a banker and you tell them that you want to be a banker and you're looking for opportunities, you know, if you if you can impress somebody on a 30 minute phone call, a lot of times they they might know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who might be able to give you, you know, uh, you know, an opportunity. I would say that, you know, I I probably had a spreadsheet with, you know, 100 people's, you know, contact information who did banking careers. And, you know, you, it, at a certain point is a numbers game where if you get five conversations, they might lead to more conversations. Um, so I definitely, you know, did just about everything I could use utilizing that alumni network um, to the point of exhausting it, I would say. Um, but I would say that, you know, my first, I got a investment banking position, um, just like a, a smaller internship from a Carleton alum between my sophomore and junior year which is what I had on my resume when I applied for, for BMO, um, who was a Carleton alum. And I actually had two internships that were kind of both part-time that summer, both of which were actually Carleton alums um, doing different finance things. Um, and then, you know, otherwise, you know, sending just emails to, you know, even if they're not even in your alumni network and being a little more creative, you know, you have access to the internet and, you know, you can find, you know, boutique investment banks or, you know, small private equity firms or, or anything like that. And if you say, you know, I have these, qualifications, I, I can do these things for you and you, you show that you're interested, you know, you just never know who's going to give you an opportunity. And that's kind of one opportunity kind of gets you to where you need to be. So I would just, you, you, you can't be too, I guess, like bashful, but like, if you're looking for an opportunity, sometimes you just got to ask um, and, and try hard for it. Yeah. And I would add, obviously, if you guys are interested with um, in BMO, definitely follow up with us because we want to be a resource as well. And um, you know, I know a lot of people in Minneapolis that work at different groups as well. So if, if BMO isn't interesting, then, you know, we can just chat and, and see if there's a friend that I might have that um, could be helpful. Um, and I would say if you're looking for things like for your resume, if, um, if that was part of the question, um, look at both Carleton and St. Olaf's career sites. I think I saw things on both of them that were useful to me. And, and I would even go and look at um, at other schools websites, like some of the Ivy Leagues have really awesome pages that you can scroll through and just see programs that are online or, or things that you could attend or um, 
just ways that you can learn more about things um, beyond investment banking as well. That would just be my piece of advice. Um, and then I think just for getting any opportunity, um, don't say no to things on campus. Obviously, if you know, you're spread too thin, that's not good. But if there's something that interests you that's not directly related to banking, definitely do it and um, just really embrace it and get excited about it because in interviews, you stand out if you're excited about something, if you're able to talk about something. And I think when you would interview with like a managing director or a vice president or something like that in our group, um, they just want to get to know you. And um, I remember having lots of interviews where I would start to talk about some random research I did for a class and they would start to just ask questions because they just want to see um, like what you know and, and um, how you talk about things. So um, while getting relevant experience is definitely awesome, um, a lot of it just comes down to how you choose to spend your time and, um, and if you're a leader on campus and um, if you've just taken advantage of what Carleton and St. Olaf has to offer. And um, I think another thing, and then I'll stop talking, but I think another thing is being humble in your, your interviews. And if you make a mistake or if you don't know something, just say, um, that's a great question. Um, I, I haven't learned about that yet or I haven't come across that yet, but I'll definitely look into that. Um, don't try to make something up because I think that looks candidly a lot, um, a lot worse. And you're just going to waste time when you could be going through more questions and, and showing that you understand other things. So people, um, or alternatively, people be, if you do try, if you do want to try, can't caveat that you don't know what you're talking about, but say how you would think about it. We also do exactly. like that. Where it's like, I haven't learned about that yet, but based on what I do know, you know, here's how I would think about it. And you might be wrong, but that also definitely shows, you know, if you, if you have a general understanding of, you know, finance or business or accounting, and if you don't know that specifically, but you know things around it, you might find your way to the right answer, or they might know that you're smart just by the way you're talking about things. It exactly. also shows that Sorry, you're going to initiative and you're going to jump into things that maybe you don't know 100% about, but you're willing to go for it too. Lots of great mm -hmm. stuff there. This is so... Yeah. Such good advice. And I just want to note the time because we're already a little bit over. And I know, Eric, you need to get off to vacation, it sounds mm -hmm. like. <laughs> and um, you all are probably in different time zones than us. So just want to respect that and, and say thank you so much for sharing some incredible advice as well as some fantastic insights into um, what I would say is an area or aspect of investment banking that we don't really talk about quite enough and, and the ways that it manifests in your work was really cool to see and to learn more about BMO was great as well. Um, and so I would encourage those of you who are on this call, if you have continuing questions to reach out to Eric and Mara, I will go ahead and if it sounds okay to you, it sounds like Eric and Mara, you're okay with sending emails out to students to get your contact information to them. Um, so we'll share that as well as the slides with you all tomorrow and um, feel free to reach out. And thank you for coming tonight, everybody. I really appreciate it. And this was fantastic. And um, everyone have a great night and take care and good luck in, in next steps and career steps. Yeah, thanks for coming guys and um, good luck with midterms. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Just about that time. Yep. All right, everyone. Thank you, Eric. Thank, thank, thank you, guys. Maria. Take care. Take care. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye. Bye.